Over to you, Jasmine. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We're super, super excited and honored to have Dean Riley from MIT giving us his living histories. And uh, for the sake of time, to not take any more of Dean's time, I'm going to pass it on to him. Thank you, Jess, Jasmine, and all the organizers. Um, I think it's been a, a really humbling experience to reflect back in my life and realize how naive I've always been. Um, but um, I, I'm sure there will be more twists and turns in my life. life and uh, but I thought I'd summarize my journey as a series of identity crises, and, which I'm, I'm sure many of you can relate to as an inter interdisciplinary scientist and as an immigrant or a descendant of immigrants. And we all have our own stories. So my story started in, in California when my parents were in grad school studying marine biology and plant biology. I will talk more about them in a moment, but before I had the opportunity to develop any memory of California and, it, and its stunning landscapes, uh, my family- um, moved I'm so sorry, Jean, but the screen is cut off. Oh. So you may want to reshare the screen. Okay. Um, now we can see the full screen. Okay. It's fine. Yep. Good. Yep. Okay. So sorry. Do you want to re-record or keep going? Um, we can. Up to you. I I think we'll keep it real and let you keep going. Okay. Sounds good. Um, where were I? Oh, I was talking about the move moving back. So, um. Right. Essentially, before before I had any memory of California, um, my my family moved to Taiwan, where my uh, my brother and 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 I grew up in a village that was formerly a U.S. military base. And can you see the screen now? Yeah. Okay, yes. Good. Um, so I grew up in Taiwan, and the, the education there was very rigorous, but also very strict. And, and I was subject to much corporal punishment at that time, and especially by my English teacher. And I think that tells you how bad my English was. Um, I, but my parents never followed the rules. Um, they encouraged me to, and encouraged me and my brothers to explore freely and test the boundary of everything. And so I would often skip weeks of schools to, for example, to learn scuba diving with my dad to, so that we can see corals spawning at night. And, and, and to go to remote mountains in China to hunt for uh, the earliest animal fossils. And because of these experiences, and coupled with uh, at that time a very deep ethnicity divide in the Taiwanese society, uh, I've always felt that, uh, that I was somewhat an outsider. And also because of being born in the US with a bad English, the identity crisis uh, ran deep in me. And in Taiwan, uh, we have to choose a college major while in high school. I was doing well uh, academically, but, but there was a problem. Uh, my passion was in music, which I was actually really bad at. Um, so I was fortunate in my senior year in high school that two of my good friends uh, became really interested in physics. And they were so passionate that I decided to give physics a try as well. Uh, so, so I became a physics major at National Tsinghua University uh, in Taiwan. It, it is a very rigorous training environment, and, and I love that all the professors there were all deeply devoted into teaching and inspiring us. But at the same time, my identity crisis made me really curious about what colleges are like in the U.S. So, so I took advantage of a study abroad program to to get back to California, where I was born but have no memory of. And at UC Berkeley, I, I met a great mentor, Ron Shen, who, um, whose lab works on nonlinear spectroscopy. And Ron was super generous with, with his time and resources. And I started to learn optics from a really diverse group of people, uh, including Naji here, who actually gave one of the living history talks earlier this year. And these amazing people are essentially all outsiders in the U.S., and, and that made me feel at home. And Ron taught, taught me 
many important lessons. And one of them was to be, I think, both generous and, and critical at the same time. So this overall experience was transformative and I continued my path in, in physics and got into a PhD program at Harvard. And my original goal going to Harvard was to study quantum optics. But once I got there, my eyes were really opened uh, by the rich interdisciplinary research that was happening on campus. In particular, Harvard had just opened a new department called systems biology and the founding department Chair Mark Kirshner was giving talks at all the graduate dorms. And also read a commentary by Mark uh, that convinced me that my quantitative background can be really useful in biology, which is, I think, full of interesting and open questions as from a physics perspective. And, and he said that systems biology attempts all of this through quantitative measurements, modeling, reconstru reconstruction, and theory. And systems biology is not, not a branch of physics, but differs from physics in, in that the primary task is to understand how biology generates variations. And no such imperative to create variations uh, exists in the physical world. And I thought, how cool was that, right? Uh, but I was afraid of jumping straight into biology because I've never taken any biochemistry or genetics. Um, and But luckily, there was a guy in the chemistry department who was developing optical techniques to probe living processes. So I joined Sonny Shi's lab and was co-advised by David Nelson to develop single molecule imaging methods in living cells. And we've created ways to quantify gene expression, new ways to monitor transcription factor dynamics in vivo. And Sonny had really super strong intuitions on everything and taught me to focus on the big questions. Um, he also taught me to be bold and work really, really hard and go out of the way to recruit the best and most talented people. And one of those people was Johan Elf, who was a postdoc at that time and become a really important life lifelong mentor, uh, even years after he started his own lab at Uppsala University. Before Johan left Cambridge, uh, remember he told me that his biggest fear is that I will always remain to be a pure physicist. Um, but but I was uh, I, I was still uh, debating and hasn't hasn't made up my mind yet. Uh, should I stay in physics uh, on the physics side of biophysics, or should I dive deep into biology? Uh, it was at th that time in the, in the late two thousands that the new development caught my eye. And that is the cost of DNA sequencing was decreasing dramatically. And all of a sudden people could sequence millions of single molecules. And that was orders of magnitude more than the individual molecules that I spent so much time um, in, in grad school. And, and I read a paper by Jonathan Weissman and, and Nick Ingolia, then at UCSF, that described a really clever way of using high throughput sequencing to study what each and every ribosome is doing in a cell. And I was totally blown away and joined Jonathan's lab to do a postdoc and later found a second mentor in Carol Gross. In many ways, UCSF is the polar opposite of Harvard. Um, it is super collaborative, collegial, and there was no physics department. And so I was fully immersed in biology and learning from my mentors, my friends, and all the super exciting seminars that are filled with biology jargons that I have to learn. Um, and at the same time, I was, I was able to extend my interest in, in quantitating uh, the central dogma and, and finding protein production um, has evolved to be really, really precise as illustrated by, by this a ATP synthase complex that consists of eight different subunits and all the eight components are synthesized at, at, at ratios that are really precisely proportional to the stoichiometry in the complex. And it's this type of precise biology that motivates much of my, uh, the research in my current lab at MIT, where we're developing new quantitative methods to, uh, to discover new mechanisms in the central dogma. Uh, for example, 
uh, we recently found that many bacterial species do not have coupled transcription and translation. And instead, their RNA polymerases run away from the ribosomes. And that leads to a completely different regime of gene expression and regulatory landscapes. And I'd, I'd be happy to share with you more on the science another time, but to summarize what I've learned in my life, in my journey so far, I think it's great to embrace our split identity, uh, whether it's uh, in scientific disciplines and, uh, or personal identities, and recognize that crosstalk is a powerful tool for making advances and discoveries. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Jean. That's the, the really, really inspiring. Um, I guess, I guess my my question to you is is regarding this this interesting contrast that you had between you know UCSF, where you only had uh, kind of surrounded by by people who are really really immersed in the biology, versus uh, a place like Harvard, which has you know very kind of strong and big and dominating physics department. If somebody finds themselves in in an environment like like Harvard, which is you know a lot of universities have a very great physics departments, how how do you recommend they kind of reach out and form those cross departmental collaborations when you don't have this opportunity to just kind of live in a place like UCSF and be, be forced to be immersed? I think as a trainee, I was super naive and, and th I thought that's the way science should be done uh, at that time. And uh, I was brought to different uh, environment and got to see very different ways of operation. So I think once a person um, sees that there's another way of doing science, there's collaboration is useful and helpful in many ways, uh, as Lucy just pointed out. And um, I think there's nothing stopping you. Um, it's, it's just the environment shapes our experiences and that's why it's, it's great to change environment once in a while and especially as a trainee to go to different places. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask one, uh, one more question from the, from the chat from Sri. Um, so you mentioned, you know, this tension between being generous and, and critical at the same time. Could you possibly highlight how, how you navigate this tension and and the, this balance when you're you're mentoring students and trainees. <laughs> that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, I think one thing I learned from all my mentors is that you see the best in everyone, and and I think everyone has their strength, and and whoever you see in the lab are the people who I like enjoy I enjoy working with. And um, so I need to be generous with my time and, and resources, but at the same time, it, it's bad to be over generous, right? And and it's good to um, to be critical at the same time. So so you know, I think seeing the best in people is is really important, uh, and helping them them getting through getting to the, the their goals. Absolutely, thank you so much. Thank you.